thank you everybody for for coming today. Um, this is the fourth, fifth one of these we've done, and um, um, each of them has been a pleasure. Each of them has looked at a different partner and a different project around the world, and um, um, we are all enjoying it. I think as much as the as, as the people who come are, because it's giving us a chance to learn more about the projects and share it with our staff as well. So, so thank you all for for being here. Today, we're super excited um, to take you to Equatorial Guinea, a tiny country on the Atlantic coast of Africa, and, um, and to welcome David Montgomery, um, who is the director of the Bioko Biodiversity Protection Program, a long-term collaboration between Drexel University in Pennsylvania and the National University of Equatorial Guinea. Um, David has a bachelor's from Grinnell and an MBA from Drexel. And I'm not sure we've had a project lead with an MBA before, so we can expect exquisite accounting and reporting, right? Um, right. Um, David spent the majority of the last 10 years living and working in Equatorial Guinea, um, um, most recently as the national manager of the Bioko program, and you'll learn in a minute what that means. Um, we also welcome Luke Powell, who is principal researcher of Trop Tropi Bio, an international partnership for tropical biology and conservation, and an affiliated faculty member at the University of Glasgow, with a bachelor's from Tufts and an MSc from University of Maine. Uh, but you have a PhD. Where's the PhD from? That's a Louisiana State University. Louisiana. I, you know, I had a friend who used to teach at Louisiana State. Vaughn Langman, anyway, in Shreveport. Excellent. Um, Luke has been working in tropical rainforests since 2005, most recently in Equatorial Guinea at the site of the new park, which he's going to tell us about. So without further ado, over to you guys and excited to learn about your project. Thank you so much, James. Uh, we're really thrilled to be able to collaborate with Rainforest Trust on this really exciting initiative. So um, here we have a beautiful uh, black-necked wattleye, one of the many interesting birds in Equatorial Guinea. And, and I'll be sharing with you today about our plans to create um, Parque Nacional de La Paz in Equatorial Guinea. So just to situate everyone where, where we are, um, here's Equatorial Guinea in red. Um, it has a pretty strange um, national boundary uh, based on its colonial history. And so there is a um, island called Bioko Island, and that's where I am actually currently. Uh, and then the mainland portion, which you can see on the map, is uh, is uh, where the site of this particular project was taking place. Um, Equatorial Guinea is the only Spanish-speaking country in, in Africa, and it kind of occupies this unique area where the Guinean forests of West Africa and the Congo Basin rainforest inter, inter, um, interact, um, which is particularly true on Bioko Island. Um, it's an oil economy, uh, primarily, and unregulated hunting is the largest threat to the biodiversity here. Um, Bioko Island is interesting and, and uh, is kind of considered a natural ecological laboratory, a lot of endemic species here. Um, it's considered a hotspot within a hotspot, which is why our project exists, and is uh, critical for endangered primates and sea turtles. The continental region where where this um, new, new collaboration with Rainforest Trust will be taking place is uh, about 90% forested and home to a rich array of Congo Basin flora and fauna, which my colleague Luke will tell us more about later. So here we go, a little bit more detail. I'll be just speaking briefly about our project on Bioko and then we'll jump over to the continental region. So the BBPP, the Bioko Biodiversity Protection Program, was started about 25 years ago. Um, it's a collaboration between the National University of Equatorial Guinea and the Academy of Natural Sciences of Drexel University. And our goal is to better conserve um, primarily, initially, Bioko Island's unique biodiversity. But now um, we have a broader mission, which is to improve the understanding, management, and protection of Equatorial Guinea's natural environment through leadership, partnership, and collaboration, which I think this project um, is a perfect example of. Um, some of the photographs on the right, uh, the Penance Red Colitis there is one of the most critically endangered primates in the world, only found on Bioko Island. Um, and there are some just examples of our project in action. We do a lot of outreach and education work, um, collaborating with students and faculty at the National University, obviously typical biodiversity um, monitoring, uh, camera trapping and, and forest monitoring. Um, we also strive for impact. So through our relationship with the government of Equatorial Guinea, this, this photo on the bottom left 
uh, on the bottom right uh, shows us last year releasing um, one of seven critically endangered green sea turtles, um, which were confiscated by the government, and then we were able to actually facilitate their release. So those those are examples of some of the actions that we that we engage in. Next slide. Is that a picture of Bioko or is that a picture of the mainland? So this is a picture of beautiful Bioko Island. And, and wow. one of the reasons why I've, I've, I've stuck around for um, a considerable amount of time here in Equatorial Guinea, I mean, it's absolutely a paradise. Um, well, actually, we didn't, we didn't our... just say you're in Equatorial, you're in Bioko right now. Yes, I'm currently so all of this is just 10 o'clock at night. Side, <laughs> it's just the other side of that white wall behind you. <laughs> almost, almost. Um, so this cool. is this is down on the southern coast, one of the nesting sea turtle beaches that we that we um, work to protect um, and have an active research camp here. That waterfall that you see there um, is where our researchers and and volunteers and students bathe when <laughs> when they're um, getting out of the forest. So it's it's really an amazing site um, and one of the many incredible places in Equatorial Guinea. It really is a hidden gem in in Central Africa. Here we have um, just a few of the you know, species that we work to protect, that's the Bioko drill, the leatherback sea turtle, and this community, um, which we have a very long relationship with, and all of our activities strive to um, create income generating opportunities for the locals um, to incentivize them to uh, care about biodiversity. And I think we have a really strong track record on that front to be able to translate into this new project that will be starting shortly. Okay, so now we're jumping um, to the continental region of Equatorial Guinea, um, approximately the area that you see there in the red. So in 2022, Equatorial Guinea is definitely at an inflection point in its history. Um, you can see there that uh, from you know, the colonial period until, until basically the late 1990s, Equatorial Guinea was one of the poorest countries in the world. Um, very small population, it's only about a million and, and less than a million and a half people here. Um, but then with the discovery of offshore oil in the late 90s, um, their economy super skyrocketed. There was a huge boom. Um, a lot of uh, investment was made in critical infrastructure. Um, and now things are a little bit changing. Um, obviously, oil is still a big part of the economy, but there's an increasing focus on diversifying the economy. Um, they're thinking more about things like agriculture, fishing, um, logging, of course, which has been a big part of their economy as well, although relatively small compared to oil, um, and things like tourism. So through this project, we really hope to encourage the, the more sustainable use of the forest, and um, that's a big part of our project as well. Um, this is a really interesting video. So, so this Ciudad de la Paz, which is, again, that central area of the mainland region of Equatorial Guinea, um, was declared by the president to be the new National, it will become the new national capital of Equatorial Guinea eventually. Um, currently, that is Malabo, where I am currently um, sitting in, in on Bioko Island. Um, but you can see over the last, you know, um, twenty years how that has gone from pristine rainforest into a quite large uh, footprint. And the area that we're working to preserve is directly adjacent to this footprint that you can see in the satellite image. And most of that development has happened over the last ten years. Next slide. And here you have some images of what that actually, what that footprint looks like. It's primarily roads cutting through pristine jungle, um, pristine rainforest. Uh, you also have like five-star hotels, um, conference centers, a brand new university, um, separate, a different university than the one that we work with, the National University. Um, and it's it's just a really incredible explosion of activity in this in this remote part of the country that we're really working to mitigate um, potential negative impacts to the, to the biodiversity that's found directly adjacent to this area. But it also, and we can talk more about this later, there are also incredible opportunities due to the fact that there's been this um, investment. And so I think when thinking about ecotourism and opportunities to collaborate with young researchers, it's, it's really an interesting opportunity. So um, this, is our, this is our project, um, and I'll be going into detail a little bit here about the main deliverables that we hope to accomplish. Um, but in a nutshell, we want to sustainably develop a new protected area um, in collaboration with the government and local stakeholders. And this will increase the protected area coverage from 19.3% to 23.3% of national territory. 
So although Equatorgany has not officially signed on to 30 by 30, um, there are a lot of indications that they are working towards that goal, and this will be an important step in that process. Um, and of course, our intense focus throughout the entire project will be ensuring that there is long-term sustainability, not only for this protected area, but setting up a pathway by which um, you know, our partners and potential partners in the future will be able to be a real collaborating um, co-management partner for the government of Equatorial Guinea when it comes to their protected area system. So of course, um, this is a very collaborative effort. Um, and the thing that unites the different collaborators on this project is our relationship with Indo4AP. So Indo4AP is the National Park Service, essentially, of Equatorial Guinea. They're, they're responsible for the protected area system. Um, and here pictured on the bottom is an individual, uh, the director general of that institution, Fidel Asono, as well as um, Cayetano, somebody who was instrumental in developing this project with, with our team. Um, of course, the project began when Luke's group, the Biodiversity Initiative, actually started doing some research um, in the site that we um, desire to designate way back 10 years ago. Um, and Luke will be explaining a little bit more about that history. Um, and through, through that history and through our program, um, as well as um, the Bristol Zoological Society and the University of West England in Bristol, and these two individuals who have a long history of working in Equatorial Guinea as well, we decided to join efforts and um, try to make something happen with regards to this reserve. Um, David Fernandez on the lower left has been working in Equatorial Guinea for the last 20 years, um, first on Bioko and now, now more um, on the mainland. So essentially, um, the, the plan is that over the course of this upcoming year, we'll be doing some biodiversity surveys, preliminary land surveys, and working with the communities that are in the area. Um, there aren't that many, uh, which is a positive, um, but there are some, and there are people that depend on the forest that will be de eventually designated um, as national parks. So we need to work with those communities to develop um, free prior and informed consent, as well as um, work with them on, on understanding their needs and thinking about um, investment programs. In 2024, we'll be beginning some of those investment programs, um, addressing some of the socioeconomic needs that may, that may exist in, in those communities. We'll be looking at developing the protected area governance model. Um, we're in conversation now with the Frankfurt Zoological Society, who were um, also uh, expecting to come to Equatorial Guinea in early, early 2023 to begin the process of establishing this relationship through this project with the government of Equatorial Guinea. And, and that's um, something we're really excited about. Of course, we also then begin training personnel, um, continuing biodiversity surveys, understanding exactly what's in this area is something of great interest to all of us. Um, we have indications, but, but we have a lot more work to do. Um, in 2025, that's when the formal government designation will occur. We'll actually be able to have a park staff, train up eco guards, develop some infrastructure management center, et cetera. Um, and then over the course of the following years, we'll really operationalize the management plan um, and ensure long-term sustainability beyond the length of the five-year project that we've, that we've articulated. Okay, I think it's my turn here. My name is Luke L. Powell. I co-direct this project with David Montgomery. Um, originally, my background is in ornithology, um, but I'm lucky enough here to talk about two of my favorite things, which is maps and, uh, and birds and mammals and really cool critters. So I'm gonna walk you through some of the, um, the, the geography of this project and of Equatorial Guinea, and then I'm gonna show you some pictures of the great birds and mammals that are found within the reserve. So I guess, um, pay attention here to this map because it's going to come up again and again. Uh, this is basically the continent of Equatorial Guinea. Um, it's roughly the size of Massachusetts and green is forested. So we're looking at at least 90-95% forest and lots of high integrity forest included here. The yellow areas are already protected. Um, they're part of the 13 uh, PA system that they have in country. And this uh, pink area here is the new Parque Nacional de La Paz. That's uh, La Paz National Park, La Paz being the name of Ciudad de La Paz being the name of the, uh, the new capital city that, that David discussed. Now, this um, new national park uh, is 108,000 hectares, and it is located right next to two already existing protected areas, Nzas National, National Monument 
and in Sork National Park. So the whole complex is about 200,000 hectares uh, and has uh, less than four or roughly 400 people living within the boundaries of the park proper. There's only one paved road through the park and it's this one just here. So it's uh, relatively, uh, or I would say most of it is quite pristine uh, forest as far as that goes. And, uh, and we're pretty excited to have the opportunity to protect it. Um, and just a quick overlay to give you a feeling of scale here. I'm originally from New York. And so it's roughly the size of two New York cities. So not a small uh, area that we're talking about, big enough to sustain um, populations of the, among the widest ranging Central African fauna, which we're, we're pretty excited about. So I'm just gonna zoom in on this little square here, which is the new capital city that David mentioned. Here is a satellite imagery, green being forest, and uh, the um, this sort of uh, brownish tan area being um, the, the new city grid. And there's a five-star hotel just here. There is a brand new university that now has about 600 students. And um, all of this area inside the yellow will be the new national park. So it is right smack next to the new capital city. Um, this here, um, this area here in the corner is a 100 hectare research plot, um, about 100 football fields worth. And that's really the only area that we've surveyed where we've surveyed the biodiversity so far. So that's 0.1% of what would be the national park. And so we have a lot of the area to explore, which will start um, around January. And I'm gonna show you a bunch of the fauna that we've found so far, just keeping in mind that it's in this tiny minuscule little area relative to the size of, of this uh, enormous uh, national park. So most of the park looks pretty much like this. Uh, it has this national monument right next to it here. And just, we're looking at basically a relatively pristine closed canopy, Central African uh, rainforest. So really fantastic stuff. Um, and right into the fauna here. So uh, this is a blue-breasted kingfisher. I took this picture in July inside the area of the reserve within the closed canopy forest. And I was told to um, show you more pictures of birds. And so I am not going to say no to that. Here's a bunch of pictures all taken within walking distance of the new university inside the area of the reserve. These are um, mostly understory insectivorous species, which are super dear to my heart. Because to me, they're, they're the heart and soul of, of the rainforest. They're typically not hunted. So they really have their, their they are, uh, they really have their finger on the pulse. They're indicators of the health of the, of the rainforest. And there, there's no coincidence that there's expression canary in the coal mine, right? Birds are fantastic indicators of ecosystem health. And it's one of the reasons that we, um, we spent a lot of time um, studying them there. So, so far, in a very limited amount of work in that 0.1%, in and around the new capital city, we've found 288 species. So not too bad. Okay, and this is my personal favorite here. This is Picothartes aureus, the gray-necked rock fowl. It's uh, one of the first animals that David Attenborough was on TV for in black and white. He's like unrecognizable as like a 20-something year old uh, guy. Um, he, uh, he was looking for uh, the other species of Picothartes here. This is a chicken size, roughly chicken sized bird that has this bizarre face coloring of blue and red. It's on the cover of birds of Western Africa. And there's only like somewhere between two and 10,000 of these things in the whole world. They only exist in Western Central Africa. They almost certainly exist in this new reserve and they nest in this student. This was taken by my, my grad student in Parque Nacional in Sork, which is part of that 3PA complex I mentioned. So this is uh, one of the places they nest underneath these rocks. Um, giant boulders basically you can see that little shape is a is a person so these are huge boulders and this puts them in conflict because this is a place where um, where hunters love to spend the night as well and so uh, you can imagine there's some real human wildlife conflict here this is really um, species that's uh, just just fantastic and probably should be endangered but we don't know enough about it to, to really list it but we're almost certain here that we have nine endangered species within this new park, certainly within the, the 3PA complex. Uh, four of them have already been confirmed within the, the new national park. Gray parrot, arguably the smartest bird on earth. Uh, the chimpanzee, our closest living relative, uh, white-bellied pangolin, and of course, African forest elephant. So I'll take you some through some of those other um, endangered and, and fauna of um, conservation concern here. 
So this uh, Hippocideris curtis, that's the short-tailed round leaf bat to your uh, anglophone. Um, Laura Torrent, my PhD student, took this picture in July when she was surveying uh, the adjacent and Sork National Park. And she found uh, one of uh, only a small handful of individuals that's ever been seen of this species. It's the only endangered bat in this part of Africa and one of only 10 endangered bats in all of Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, really fantastic species, maybe a face that only a mother could love, but um, beauty is in the eye of the polar, I suppose. <laughs> Um, okay, this is the uh, Volkswagen bug with four legs, otherwise known as the giant pangolin. It's very endangered, just like every other species of pangolin because of their scales are highly prized. Um, this uh, picture was taken in the adjacent uh, PA, and I should introduce our uh, camera trapping program that we've been doing for the last six or seven years, um, where we are attempting to blanket uh, the country with uh, with camera traps so that we know where the fauna are, which is some of the reasons why we are, have a pretty good idea of what's within this national park, even though we've surveyed a relatively small amount of it so far. Okay, this beautiful animal is a Red River hog. And uh, if we stitch together these still images, we can see this almost video of her and her piglets running around on the forest floor, uh, looking beautiful here within the walking distance from the new capital city. Likewise, this is a uh, very large antelope uh, known as a Sitatunga, and she is here poking out of the forest um, just within the new uh, national park with her beautiful and camouflaged fawn here. And this is important that we're getting animals here, not just adults, but we're getting beautiful, uh, young, healthy, sustaining uh, populations of these animals that are reproducing. Um, so this is obviously fantastically important because we know that they're not just hanging on, they're um, producing food for these higher predators, um, apex predators like, like this lovely leopard, which uh, we captured in one of our camera traps as well. And so I, I can't possibly take credit for um, these camera trap uh, images. These were um, almost all taken by um, in the 4AP, uh, the National Park Service and our long-term collaborator on the ground and who very much helped us write um, the proposal for this and uh, largely developed the idea for it themselves. Uh, this is Cayetano Ibana, uh, oh, excuse me, uh, that's Cayetano Ibana on the right there. Um, a friend of mine who, I saw him in July and he told me, Luke, this is so cool for me um, because all the other protected areas in Equatorial Guinea were, were basically set up by, by, by the Europeans. Um, but this one here, we get the chance to do this from the ground up ourselves. The Ghanaians drawing the boundaries, serving for the animals, and he, he took so much pride in that. You know, uh, it really, uh, it really moved me. Um, likewise, we've confirmed uh, this uh, lovely uh, African forest elephant. Of course, extremely endangered. Um, you can tell it's a forest elephant because it has the little tusks and the smaller ears, um, so that they don't get caught uh, in the brush while they're romping through the forest there. Um, this is that same map that you saw before. Now we've, uh, we know from a, one previous study where they did um, survey transects walking the forest, that they think there's somewhere between 400 and 1800 elephants in Equatorial Guinea. Uh, between that and the camera traps, we know they're in five of the different protected areas. And crucially, they're in both of the ones that are right next to Parque Nacional La Paz. And it's important to note that these uh, areas between the two, the protected areas, there's no real barrier there. So there's no reason that the um, animals can't walk freely in between the existing and the new protected areas. So we're pretty certain that there's forest elephants across this whole landscape, which is really exciting. We're, we're uh, really jazzed to get out there in, in, in January with Indifor and start blanketing um, the new national park with camera trap to see where the populations of these endangered animals really are. Okay, here we have our closest living relative the um, chimpanzee, very much endangered. And um, I'm, I'm very proud. This is like the only camera trap that I set up, um, but it happened to get, uh, get super lucky. This is uh, within walking distance from, from the new reserve, like 200 meters from the city, and we captured this awesome population of chimpanzees there. Uh, this is uh, from an adjacent park where you can see mom and baby uh, walking through the forest there. Love that one with the big ears on the baby. 
Uh, we think there's somewhere between four and 10,000 chimps in EG. They're known from seven of the protected areas, including confirmed within the new national park in that little purple square there, but probably they exist throughout the park. And again, we're psyched to get out there and find where the populations of these are. Okay, critically endangered Western lowland gorilla. This is mom and baby here uh, from a nearby protected area. We captured on our camera traps and of course, Big Daddy Silverback, um, not far away from her. Um, and so uh, we know little about gorillas except the fact that they're in many of the protected areas in Equatorial Guinea. Um, the previous study, um, was basically counting nests of chimps and gorillas. But when the nest is on the ground, um, it's not clear if it's a big chimp or a gorilla. So they couldn't really estimate how many there were here. But we do know that they're in five of the different protected areas, including being confirmed in both of the PAs that are right next to the new national park. So we're pretty certain that they're there as well. And again, psyched to get out there uh, with cameras and, and teams on the ground uh, looking for them to, conserve, to, uh, to figure out where their populations are exactly. Uh, and um, it would be a mistake to not share the uh, photo of the mammals that we capture most often on camera traps. Uh, so these are uh, hunters uh, and, and their dogs. And so, and this is something that the um, folks have been doing there for thousands of years, probably from the same or similar ethnic groups. And so um, at, um, in the historical times, this was fine because it was done in a form that was sustainable. But the human population of Equatorial Guinea and that of Sub-Saharan Africa is, at a whole is going to quadruple by the end of the century, literally four times as many people in Equatorial Guinea. And that'll put enormous amount of pressure on, on the ecosystem. So um, our partners, INDIFOR, the National Park Service, they're, um, they're fantastic collaborators, but they need more resources to um, enforce the, the the ban on primate, on primate hunting to enforce illegal, uh, the, the shutdowns of illegal logging operations. Um, they're really struggling uh, in that realm, but they, they certainly have the, um, they have the, the desire um, and the, uh, the desire to, to, to really protect these resources. They only have two working vehicles. They have two trucks. The whole National Park Service in the whole country has two trucks. So they have a big job because there's a lot of hunters out there that are covering a lot of ground. So as I, I wrap things up here, I just want you to um, maybe stare into the eyes here of our closest living relative um, of this image that was captured within the boundaries of the new national park. This is a place where only about 400 people live within this, the boundaries of the park proper. It has the full complement of Central African fauna, including at least nine endangered animals. And um, we have Fantastic collaborators on the ground in the National Park Service and Indifor. They're, they're very bright, helpful. Uh, they're very educated and they understand how protected areas management works, um, but they are very much lacking in resources. And um, we have this new national park here that's immediately adjacent to a brand new capital city and a brand new university with a biology department. And there are just incredible opportunities for, for ecotourism for research, for environmental education. Um, it's just a really exciting time. And um, so we really believe that here, with your help, we can create a national park here that's, that's, that's the model uh, for national parks and for protected areas, uh, both for Equatorial Guinea, but also for Central Africa as a whole, because there's this um, incredible fauna out there. And, um, and, but there are real lack of resources to protect it. So with, with your help, I think we can really um, accomplish that goal. Thanks so much for your attention. Thank you. And you're talking to us from Portugal? Yes, Portugal, exactly. Wonderful. Well, yes. and I hope it's so well for both of you, it's a little bit late, but but thank you. That was that was super fascinating. Um we have some interesting questions coming in, and I'll 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 relay those to you in a minute, but I'll just ask one or two myself first, if that's okay. Um, I think none of us, other than the two of you, have ever been to Equatorial Guinea. Um, so I, I just want to ask you, what's the forest like um, when you're there? What do you see and hear and smell and feel? Is it, is it incredibly buggy and uncomfortable? Are there leeches? Um, are you happy when you leave? What's it like? 
Thanks, James. Uh, no, no, no leeches, fortunately. Um, so when I, um, of course, I haven't been to Equatorial Guinea for, you know, two plus years because of the pandemic, but I was lucky enough to go back in July. And uh, the moment I stepped into the forest, I, um, you might imagine uh, in a tropical rainforest that you're sweating and the sun is beating down. Um, and that's not like this place at all. And there's a reason they put the capital city there. It's the climate's really mild. In fact, this is like, this is the, the driest, among the driest tropical rainforests in the world. There's this like um, cold pocket of the Atlantic right next to Equatorial Guinea that wafts cool air and clouds um, across the landscape in, in the summer. And it effectively uh, shields you from those harsh elements. So I stepped into that forest um, in July after not being there for two plus years. And, um, and I felt uh, strangely comfortable. Uh, the, the, the bugs weren't buzzing me. Um, it was like 78 degrees and cloudy. And uh, there's just this cacophony of, of bird sound all around, right? The, the understory is, is filled with these forest green bulls and other understory birds bubbling and buzzing. And uh, the, up in the top, you can hear the, the hornbills doing their, their clicking and clacking and yelping. And uh, my favorite, I think, uh, of all is, um, I mentioned probably, well, arguably the smartest bird in the world is, uh, is the African gray parrot, and, and they do this incredible whistling sound that sounds out of this world. And the closest I can come to is maybe, um, you know, if R2-D2 were a parrot, um, it's like these bizarre whistles and buzzes. And, um, and to me, um, uh, it, just, it just makes me feel like I'm in a real proper rainforest. Wonderful. Um, so, I, I've never been to Equatorial Guinea, but I've spent quite a bit of time just across the borders in Cameroon on one side and in Gabon on the other. And we were always under the impression that there wasn't a lot of wildlife left in Equatorial Guinea. We knew that there was no, that the National Park Service was not terribly functional, as, as you describe, with, with only two vehicles and, um, and no one ever went there um, that we knew. So I'm curious, given the tremendous poaching pressure on elephants in Central Africa and, and even for bushmeat on gorillas and chimps and other primates. Um, I'm impressed that, that there seem to be populations left across the whole park system and even in this unprotected area. Why, why do you think that is? And David, do you wanna take this one? Sure. I mean. I think I think one thing to definitely keep in mind is that all of these countries and ecosystems are connected and that the animals are probably most likely moving, um, you know, seasonally between Cameroon, Gabon and Equatorial Guinea. Um, and so in that sense, I think some of the more, you know, more well known successes of Gabon and Cameroon are probably um, advantageous for the situation in Equatorial Guinea. That said, of course, when dealing with migratory or, or moving animals, um, you know, a weak spot in that chain can really be detrimental. I think also it's true that Equatorial Guinea, like Gabon, is very sparsely populated. Um, and so while there is tremendous pressure from hunting from the relatively small population that is there, there's also quite a lot of remote forest that just remains, um, you know, by virtue of its remoteness. Um, pretty pretty well protected. So, yeah, there's a lot of work to be done on the on the enforcement front, on the resource front. Um, we're very hopeful that this project will help to alleviate and start that, you know, positive virtuous cycle when it comes to some of those issues. Um, but, but yes, um, I think I think Equatorial Guinea is. I mean, to be frank, it's it's kind of surprised me over the years, especially here on Bioko. Here's a a much more isolated ecosystem, right? And there's a lot of hunting, and and we we're we're documenting the the amount of animals that are coming into the bushmeat market, and yet there's still some animals left in the forest. And so I think it also is a testament to how rich um, and resilient the forests of Central Africa are as well. And and when this becomes a national park, um, will people be allowed to hunt within the national park, or 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 not? So um, the, the legal, the, the way that the laws are set up in Equatorial Guinea is that per, shotgun hunting within protected areas is not allowed, um, as well as of 
um, protected species throughout the entire country, right? So primates in particular are, are protected um, and therefore hunting of them is illegal no matter where they are hunted. Um, within the boundaries of the national park and through the development of this project, there'll be a zonation um, process by which certain areas of the park will probably be considered buffer zones um, and or community hunting zones where trapping may be allowed um, to ensure that locals, you know, rights are, are preserved. Um, the biggest problem in Central Africa is the commercial bushmeat trade. The, you know, there are issues with protein acquisition for some of these communities. And so you can't um, prohibit hunting outright in, in some of these very remote communities. But, but yeah, it's, it's, it's a little bit of a complicated answer to a simple question. No, not at all. So, 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 so commercial hunting for sale is not allowed and hunting with modern weapons like shotguns is not allowed, but subsistence hunting using traditional methods would be allowed in a controlled way. Right. And, you know, the devil's in the detail. How do you how do you actually regulate those issues? Right. But, you know, the the most urgent issue is controlling commercial hunting operations that are exporting all of the meat to cook to basically luxury markets in the in the in the big cities. All of the most concerning species is all of those species that we're most concerned about go at, you know, are, are relatively expensive. Um, for people to purchase. And so there are plenty of other alternative protein sources. Um, you know, a monkey at the market in Malabo is kind of equivalent to like a really fancy Thanksgiving, you know, ham or something. So it's, it's uh, you know, for weddings and special occasions that it tends to be um, eaten. Yeah. So it's not a food security issue. It's more a cultural issue. Yeah. Interesting. And so that's why it's so, so important to do the outreach with younger generations. And, and there's definitely a, a generational shift that's happening. Mm -hmm. um, let me just, we, we uh, first of all, let me remind um, everybody who's here that we very much welcome your, your questions. So, so please do enter questions and then I'll um, paraphrase them or, or read them. Um, and, and we have one of um, the people who's attending um, William Ao Young, and I apologize if I haven't pronounced the name right, has articulated a wonderful vision of a future of Equatorial Guinea where, where tourism um, replaces oil as the main income generator. And I he talks quite a lot about a vision for Bioko in particular, but um, I imagine that's still some distance away. What, what do, do, as you work with government and with communities, um, um, do you see a time where tourism and or perhaps carbon payments and, and other systems start to, to compete with oil as, 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 a, as a sustainable future for the country? Yeah, definitely. Definitely. It's a really compelling thought and something that we've been advocating for for a long time. And, and you know, through our project, we've kind of spearheaded some initial pilot projects for how that can work and how we can ensure benefit sharing um, for local people. Um, there are a lot of barriers to that happening in the short run. Um, that said, the government is very actively promoting the idea of, of Equatorial Guinea becoming a tourism destination. Um, and ecotourism is a big part of that. So, I mean, they've invested in these beautiful ho hotels. They have amazing road networks. Um, they really do have incredible things to see. Um, and so, you know, over the next over the next few years, I think that it's really important that the government begin to invest and make the connections between the protected area system that's housing all of this incredible biodiversity and, and landscapes and natural heritage and re, you know, connect the dots as far as the importance of that raw, raw material and those like investing in those human capacities and the protection of those areas and how that then relates to revenue opportunities for the, for the country as a whole. So, it, you know, it's part of their national development strategy. They have a pillar of ecotourism as part of their diversification plan. It's something that's that's being spoken about a lot right now, but they definitely need some international partnerships to help to make that a reality. You, you mentioned the challenge of the bushmeat trade, and I know that you guys have been studying the bushmeat trade on Bioko for 25 years and, and also trying to regulate it and reduce it. Um, and across, of course, across Central Africa, bushmeat hunting, that is hunting of wild animals for food, both for subsistence, but also 
to ship to towns and cities for people to eat, um, both as a reasonable priced meal, but as you pointed out, also in many cases as a luxury special occasion um, meal, um, is it has been a deeply challenging problem across all of all of Africa and certainly all of Central Africa. So I was intrigued that you hinted that there was a generational shift. Do you actually have data that that younger people are less likely to want to consume bushmeat? Because that would be extraordinarily helpful. Yeah, actually, one of one of the most interesting um, studies that's looked at that issue comes from an aquatic name that did his PhD at Drexel, um, Deme, Demetrio Bukuma, um, who's now in a position of leadership at the United Nations here in Equatorial Guinea. Um, he looked at that as part of his PhD dissertation and looked at also differences in preferences between the different cultural groups. And there's a, there is a market difference um, in, in the types of meat that people prefer. Um, I, I don't have the, the dissertation at, at hand here, but I, I seem to recall that monkeys in particular um, were preferenced um, at a much higher degree by the older generation than, than the younger generation. So that's well, that's, a, that's a seriously hopeful. Yeah. Helpful sign. Yeah. I mean, I remember many of the results from neighboring Gabon suggested that the largest species like gorillas and the idea of people eating gorillas is, is pretty, pretty scary. Um, but that the largest species tended to be super luxury. And so they weren't actually consumed by poor people in the countryside. They were the largest species and the most endangered species were shipped to the capital city. So that um so that part of the intervention was to block transport of illegal meat products not only to not only to patrol the park is that is that something that that you guys will be will be working with the government on as well for sure and and again there's some encouraging signs um you know for a long time there's been not very much investment in kind of forest rangers and and the types of systems that you would need to actually be able to control the trade although i will say that equatorial guinea is quite competent at controlling um, movement along the road system. Uh, so, you know, all the pieces are in place. Um, and very recently, the vice president um, had a special initiative to recruit and train 200 new forest rangers who will actually be armed and able to enforce the law is the vision. So, you know, that's quite a shift. Indifor, for example, is able to report infractions and do some interventions as far as confiscating materials and things like that. But they can't actually, you know, apply the law in 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 situ. So um, I think that this will be an opportunity for Equatorial Guinea to kind of show a little bit of muscle when it comes to enforcing environmental regulations. Um, I wonder it, it'd be nice to to pull you back in as people and as wildlife lovers. I wonder if each of you could tell us um, what your favorite animal is in Equatorial Guinea and why and last time you saw it. Go ahead, Luke. <laughs> David, why don't you go first? I'm overwhelmed here. <laughs> OK. Maybe it's, it may be a completely unfair question. <laughs> no, it's a lovely question. Um, it's hard to choose. So I mean, obviously, one of the most compelling animals on Bioko is the, is the Bioko drill. Um, it's an endemic subspecies, most likely, um, although there's a lot unknown about this species. Um, the drill is found, obviously, also on mainland Equatorial Guinea and other parts of Central Africa. Um, but it's just this incredibly charismatic species. We worked with a filmmaker, Justin Jay. I highly recommend all of you to go and try to watch um, this documentary. I think it's on Amazon um, called, in, in, in the US, I think it's called Monkeys of Bioko. Um, and it's all about this incredible species. Um, super charismatic. The males have these enormous fangs. I showed you a picture. Um, they've been documented eating, you know, scavenging coconuts off the beach and just really interesting behavior. Um, last winter, I was at one of our more remote field sites. It's a site called Maraca, Maraca Playa, um, which is kind of the access point to get into the most remote parts of the Caldera Reserve. And I was crossing one of the rivers, pretty wide river, shallow at this time of the year. Um, this was in January. Actually, it was New Year's, New Year's, New Year's Eve, I believe. And um, so I was crossing the river and kind of slipping on the rocks. And I noticed because of the sound of the water, and it's quite a wide river crossing, the, on the other side, there was a drill 
also crossing from the other side. And it, it had gotten about halfway across the river before it noticed me. And I had noticed it a little, you know, just 10 seconds before it noticed me. So I had a really good opportunity to observe it, which is quite, quite rare. And then it ran away and stumbled and slipped and slid all over the riverbank as it did so. And so it was just like a really, really interesting and uh, special moment that I'll never forget. So, yeah. Luke, he's, um, he's challenged you. Okay, I, I can't come up with a sexy primate for this one, but I can share my screen and give you some sexy pictures. Um, so I'm going to. By the way, so um, by the way, Bob Ridgely, our trustee and 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 president emeritus, has jo indeed joined us. So you have a serious, um, you have um, at least one very serious uh, ornithologist listening to what you say, <laughs> just to, to make you nervous. Okay, fantastic. Uh, so I'm going to go with uh, this one here, uh, the fire-crested elith on the right side. It's one of the most common birds in the understory. And what makes it cool for me is that it's basically a professional follower of ants. So there's this special kind of ant that lives in Central Africa called a driver ant. And they basically have this these colonies. They can go up to 30 million individuals in one colony. So this is like you can be standing in somewhere like the size of a tennis court and you, you step in any place there and you're stepping on like 400 ants that then all completely attack you. And the only way to get them off is to basically tear your clothes off and beg somebody to pick the ants off you or else you're you know in horrible shape. And um, this has never happened to me, by the way. Um, it's happened the, to me. The, well, not all the clothes, but yeah. <laughs> but at least the at least on the legs. Anyway, go on. No, it's definitely happened to me. Just being, just kidding. <laughs> um, and so this the 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 system like of uh, interdependence of these animals in the system is 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 just fascinating because the the these birds, these fire crested elites, and basically almost every other one on this page. Um, uh, makes a living by eating the insects that are fleeing in terror from the, 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 the front of um, advancing ants. Um, so it just speaks to like how important different levels of the rainforest are to each other. And uh, to me that, that like interdependence and co-evolution is like is so important to, to protect and, and, and really understand. So it, it's dear to my heart. Wow, I, I you know, I, I... You you didn't mention the ants as your favorite species, but I have to say that I in the in the time that I did field work in Uganda, and these is the in, in East Africa they're called safari ants or siafu, but they're the same species. There's only one species. Um and the the colony itself is just an incredibly powerful and brilliant and frightening creature that gives you a whole different attitude towards the natural world and so, so yeah, I might have almost mentioned Siafu as my, as my my animal. But yeah. if if I can just share one brief anecdote about driver ants, one of my first experiences in Equatorial Guinea was at, at a field remote field camp up in the Caldera, which is one of the rainiest sites in Africa, by the way. Um, the Oak Island is a little bit different than the mainland, uh, and the the driver ants decided to come through camp, and the local porters and guides um, just all of a sudden started lighting the camp on fire, and I was like, what is going on? And they, of course, knew that the only way to deal with the driver ant invasion is to, to set fire to the, to the landscape and therefore <laughs> dissuade them from entering their camp. And so since it's so wet, they didn't really catch much of our equipment on fire, but it was quite alarming when it happened. Uh, the, the other solution, I mean, if you own a house in a village in East Africa and, and, and they attack your house, you can try to get rid of them. And actually, ash works. They won't cross a, a line of ash. And okay. diesel fuel works. But the That's other thing right. you can do is just to diesel leave your for, house and go fuel. and stay with your mother-in-law for a day, because then when you come back, there'll be no cockroaches, there'll be no <laughs> mice, all of the nasty stuff in your house will be gone. Anyway, um, yeah. let me ask you a little bit about your relation, your partnership with the government of, of Equatorial Guinea. So historically, Equatorial Guinea doesn't have a reputation as having the most democratic or enlightened government. You're, you're there, so you can just wink if I need to stop talking so you, so you stay safe. But but you you guys, over 25 years, have developed an extraordinary trusted partnership with, with the government um, where, where really no one else has and, um, and already made progress on Bioko um, and, and seem to be. So, so tell me a little bit about the National Park Service, about 
their development of capacity and, and whether they really are an organization you can partner with that you think will be committed to, um, to, to conservation in the future. Yeah, let me, let me just try to um, go quickly through that question, but because it's a complicated context, of course. Um, I think one of the things that's allowed the BBPP to be so successful over such a long period of time has been, well, it's been a, it's a confluence of factors, but it's a university to university partnership, which I think is really important. Um, and so uh, the, it's not like some big international NGO with potentially ulterior motives of the government may or may not um, be able to get behind in a very enthusiastic way, but rather, you know, this capacity building educational based exercise that we've been engaged in from the very beginning of the National University of Equatorial Guinea it was only founded at approximately the same time that our program started. Um, and so we've been kind of a co-partner in their in their growth over the years. Um, secondly, uh, we've been sustained, ironically, perhaps, um, by by the oil money that has existed in Equatorial Guinea, and therefore we've had you know, continuous and robust support from ExxonMobil in particular, um, which has allowed us to continue that relationship over many, many years. Um, there have been many other supporters of the program over the years, including, for example, the US Fish and Wildlife Service and, and, um, and, and many others. Uh, and then related to the, in, the Indifor part, um, so Indifor is actually historically more focused on kind of force management issues when it comes to logging. And therefore, they're un unlike many other institutions in Equatorial Guinea, they're based on the mainland. Um, and so our program being on the island has had always kind of been um, a point of difficulty of collaborating with them. But over the last you know, decade, I would say, there's been incredibly productive collaboration between Indifor and our program, as well as Indifor and the other um, collaborators on this project. They have a ton of passion, and 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 Equatorial Guinea, the, you know, there there actually is quite a lot of talent and and passion for these issues. Unfortunately, what's most difficult is you know at the highest levels getting budgets approved, getting commitments from the parliament, etc. But um, with with partner funding and with partner support, um, there's tons that can be done, and a lot of interest in doing so. So, Luke, I, I'm sure you can add a little bit to that as well. Well, in my experience, David, um, I think what, what kept me coming back uh, was really um, the the people, the employees of Indifor. They're they're in it for the long haul. Uh, the director uh, Fidel Fidel Don Fidel Esono is um, he's a good guy, and his his um, commitment to um, really properly enforcing the laws in protected areas and, and protecting biodiversity, it's real. Um, Cayetano Ibana, he has a master's degree from University of Madrid, the Autonomous University of Madrid in protected areas management. These guys, they, they understand modern methods. They, they understand how it works and they're long-term, you know, they're lifers. And so to me, um, that, that sort of um, how genuine they are about it and how um, the surprising amount of independence that uh, the National Park Service Indifor has from the rest of the federal government, that, that, that's what keeps me coming back and working there. I fe I've been told that bureaucracy is really hard in Central Africa, it's hard to get anything done. And for me, the experience has been quite the opposite. Um, walk into um, Fidel's office and you know have a great conversation with him, ask him for a permit for this and that. He says, okay, of course. I mean, why wouldn't we do this? Here you go, be on your way. And let's figure out how to work together going forward. And in fact, that's how, you know, I'm, I'm sitting here now talking to you because he told me in November, he said, hey, we have an opportunity to write this new protected area into law. Like, let's talk about it. How can we raise the money? Um, and I said, okay, I'll see what I can do. So I emailed Rainforest Trust. And, uh, and, and, and now here, here we are. So their commitment is really genuine. That, that's what keeps me coming back. Um, that's lovely, really lovely and incredibly encouraging. Um, we're, we're almost at time. Um, one person, um, one of our, our um, visitors, Cynthia Starr um, asked um, whether the project is fully funded. And, and um, um, the answer there is that um, we have recently committed to um, to you to find the funding for you um, so that you can go ahead and and um, so so you don't need to 
you don't need to stress that, but but we have not raised the money that we need to raise in order to fulfill that commitment yet. And I think this is the first of these seminars that we've done on a project which is not yet funded. These are not primarily fundraising seminars. They're primarily a chance for um, our supporters and, and friends to, to, meet, um, to meet our partners in the field. Um, but um, but um, I, I know that people will be as excited um, by this incredible opportunity to um, not only to create a new park, but to create a new culture of conservation and maybe eventually change the trajectory of a country which has been blessed with some money from oil and seems to be taking some of that money and using it to create a better future for, for nature and for its people. So um, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's just a tremendous privilege having a chance to, to meet you and, and a tremendous privilege having a chance to support what you're doing. Maybe um, a final comment from, from each of you on um, whether you're hopeful about the future of nature in Equatorial Guinea. I'm, yeah, I'm extremely hopeful. I mean, I think I'm, I'm an optimist. Um, there's, you know, there's a lot that you can look at here and be a little bit negative about, but at the end of the day, I, I've seen firsthand how resilient this forest is. I've seen a lot of the changes that have happened over the last um, you know, decade. And I'm seeing more and more indications from the government that they're very seriously considering more sustainable paths forward. Um, and uh, they, still, they still do have some oil to, to make those types of investments. So, you know, oil will eventually decline, but for the time being, they do still have some oil and they're also seriously embarking on an economic diversification project. So I'm hopeful. And Luke? L likewise here, or I wouldn't be uh, sitting here devoting the next five years plus of my life to this. And it's no question, um, we're in a really unique, place and time and history in Central Africa and Equatorial Guinea. Um, we have the sort of luxury here, or the relative luxury of having an intact ecosystem. I mean, the, the, the full complement of fauna is there on the landscape and there, there aren't that many people there yet, but there's this uh, amazing road network. And so they have great access. That makes it totally different from big chunks of the DRC, or from Gabon. You can actually get there and ecotourism can happen. Um, you know, relatively quickly and, and, and easily, and they're building a new capital city there. So that combined with, you know, my, um, my real past experience and trust with the, the National Park Service and, um, and the relationships I have with, with the people there and uh, my partnership with David and, um, and, I, and our other uh, folks who are leading this um, gives me great hope that we can do good things going forward. Well, thank you both. Um, we're, we, as I say, we're super excited. And, and, and to everybody who's joined us, thank you so much for taking an hour of your time at a busy time of year. Um, and thank you for all, all of you, our ongoing supporters of Rainforest Trust, and we're deeply grateful to you. Um, these kind of projects would not be happening without you. And um, um, some of you know that this has not been a great fundraising year for us, probably mainly because of financial markets. So we're not in a crisis, but but we're not raising as much money as we were last year at this time. And um, so if your finances allow and you wanna to contribute to this or any other project, we would be very grateful. Um, thank you all. And maybe at some point we can all meet together in Equatorial Guinea. Have a good evening. <laughs>